You're watching Telecom TV from the Etsy NFE 15 event in Nice. And I'm joined now by Diego Lopez, who is Head of Technology Exploration and Standards at Telefonica and is also the new chairman of the Etsy NFE ISG. Diego, thanks for talking again with Telecom TV. And first of all, congratulations on the new role. Thank you very much. And I see also from your bow tie that you'll be carrying <laughs> on some of the traditions of your predecessor, at least for the short term. As politicians would say, what's your manifesto? Well, the manifesto is that we have uh, come a long way and that we have achieved even more than we initially uh, thought that we were, we were going to achieve in a, in a short time, in standard time. And well, that we uh, I, I want to continue with the momentum we have, and we want I, I want to maintain the position, the the, the focus position of the uh, NFVSG in, in when it comes to the virtualization network, virtualization technologies. So I'm happy what we have achieved so far, and what if everything goes as uh, as uh, as I expect, we will keep the the position and, and hopefully enhance it. And by the way, when it comes to the bow tie, it was, uh, yes, it's precisely a, 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 a small joke I, I, I was playing with, uh, with Stephen on this, yes. So where are we with NFE standardization work? As I understand it, we're coming to the end of release two and about to start release three. Exactly. I mean, uh, something that is important to, to, to note is that when we refer to releases, we are referring to normative documents. The ISG is working not only normative in specs and requirements, the ISG is making, let's call it reports, analyzing the technology, making recommendations, <clears throat> making initial exploratory moves to see how to, uh, what to standardize and in what direction. This is something that has been continuous. We are working on that. We have been working, for example, re well, some time ago, we finished a uh, work that I'm very, uh, I think it's very interesting, which is the first analysis of how NFV and SDN were related. And, but apart from that, releases, and we have to be, we are trying to be very strict with releases because releases contains normative uh, requirements. And we want to be very clear when we're talking about that release is a set of consistent normative uh, requirements. And these are, right now we're finishing our second release of this uh, uh, kind of documents, and we're starting our third release. ISGs traditionally operate for a limited number of years. Have you received your new extension from the Etsy board? Yeah, uh, recently. Uh, well, uh, after just the first act after my, uh, my election was precisely contacting the uh, general director of, of Etsy asking for an extension. Basically because when discussing the features we wanted to have in release 3, we noticed that addressing those features were, uh, was going to take longer than the, uh, than the term that we had, that it, it was going to end with, at the end of the year. So we, we got an additional two years uh, term. I guess with any technology process like the NFE ISG, in the early stages everyone is together, everyone's trying to get a, a common goal realized. But as we develop things, you start to get different voices, different opinions, different approaches. Are you still confident that we will end up with a harmonious approach to NFE? I think that's natural. I mean, at the, at the, in the moment that things become more mature, first, second, that you go uh, deeper in the technology itself and you learn more about it, some of the possibilities and the implications. And third, you start to gain um, operational experience real life implementation, deployments, uh, users complaining even, well, you, you, you get to, to, to develop a strong, stronger opinions first, and, and second, well, the uh, interests diverge a little bit because one thing is that we all believe that we have to virtualize network functions. That was clear at the beginning, but now which functions, how, which are the implications with the rest of the, uh, of the services, etc. So that's natural, logical, and, uh, and I would say it's a, it's a sign of maturity as long as we can find after discussions and uh, some, uh, uh, some strong dissension, dissension even, we can find consensus. And this is, so far it has happened, and I'm confident it will, it will continue to happen in the future. So moving on specifically to your role at Telefonica, where is Telefonica at in its journey with NFV? Ooh, I, I would say that we are, I mean, in the evolution or the, no, the, the word is transformation. In the transformation process, I think we are, we are well advanced. 
We're advanced taking into account that this we're talking about very brand new technology and that we are uh, we are uh, in many cases we're moving in a in a territory that has not been well explored yet. But uh, there was a strong commitment from well since I joined Telefonica five years ago. Uh, I joined it because there was a, a strong commitment in Telefonica about exploring the application of softwareization and virtualization to networks. And uh, since then, what since then what, what we have managed uh, first of all, and it is very important, is to make this part of the uh, usual corporate jargon, even if, if you want. NFV is not uh, if not it's, it's not anything that you have to explain to to the uh, to the people work to the technicians working there any longer. It's something that's for sure our our customers don't notice in general, but some of them are even asking for it which is a good sign as well. And uh, it's something that uh, there are formal plans about the, the, uh, this transformation of the network in, in the different business units. There are commitments and plans, not only pilots, but, uh, but for example, I uh, always cited in Brazil, we are running a real service uh, for real users that are paying real money for, the, uh, uh, for those uh, virtualized services. And we have plans to start similar um, pilots with real users in, in many other places in our footprint. And what have been some of the major challenges that Telefonic has faced in enabling NFV trials and testing? Well, basically, to start with the technology itself. The technology, the, when we started, technology was not uh, very mature. We uh, we had to well to somehow struggle with some of our usual providers just to bring them to our side. This is something that has happened. I, I would say that there is no uh, manufacturer, both in the network uh, equipment and, and in IT, that are not interested in this kind of technology. So that's, this is something that we have done. And apart from that, well, second uh, challenge, very important, is how you operationalize the whole thing, how you integrate a, a virtual environment, cloud-oriented, in a, in a, in a, um, uh, within tools and, and procedures that are very much oriented to a fixed physical thing that is connected just based on, on, on boxes and cables and radio links and thinking in, in other terms and applying these same tools for, the, for these other terms is complicated. And well, now this is something that we have to, to uh, uh, and we are our needs as well is changing the culture and changing the, the, the very structure of the uh, of how it's not the, tr the structure of the company; it's the, the structure of the processes inside the company. You have to you have to change them, and it's it's challenged, it's complicated. Now, this is the first NFE meeting that has had a 5G element. There's been a workshop on the, the day before the the opening plenary, and there's going to be a, a brainstorming session during the meeting. What do you hope to achieve from involving 5G in NFE at this stage? Well, actually, we started discussing about whether considering 5G, I mean, the, the, uh, and using the word 5G in our release, when we started discussing release 3. In the moment we started it, there was some perception that it was uh, a little bit too loaded in political terms. Right now, 5G has consolidated as the uh, way of referring to the next generation of network infrastructures. So the natural thing is precisely that since we are uh, uh, what well, they would say an essential enabling technology for 5G to come is to incorporate uh, the, into our discussions and our analysis for the coming release and for the uh, uh, coming uh, the work in the coming years uh, to incorporate the 5G concepts that now is has gone beyond this idea of a, well it's a, it's a catchy name that just to name whatever it's going to come. Uh, in the future for the networks. Now, uh, 5G has, I mean, the 5G uh, initiatives all over the world have defined uh, a set of clear requirements, or, or at least much clearer, much clearer requirements than they used to be some, some time ago. And we're in the position of interacting with those, uh, with those initiatives, modern bodies, and, and, and to interact as well with some standard, uh, standard organizations that have started to think in 5G terms. Does this mean that service providers who want to undertake the journey to 5G, whatever form that will take, that they will have to adopt and implement NFE first? I would say definitely. I mean, the uh, point is that uh, wherever you go in, into 5G and wherever you go into, on the one hand, the use cases and the requirements we're trying to address. 
And on the other hand, in the potential costs that that would imply if you don't virtualize the, the, the infrastructure, the only way in which you can achieve this is by relying on, on NFV and software-enabled networks. I, I don't see any, any other way of doing it, at least, at least in the European market and, in, well, and, and at least in any evolved market. Don't know if you can, if you start from scratch and you can deploy your infrastructure from the, from the beginning, I don't know. But in the case of any uh, operator that has a legacy and has customers and has uh, services has to maintain, there is no other way. So how do service providers go about selecting the right vendor partners for NFV when they don't really know who are going to be the major 5G component players? Well, I, I, I think that uh, it's nothing that is well, it's what's happened with the previous generations that were very much focused on the radio interfaces. Now we are thinking in terms of the, of the whole network, and this is something that is very important because 5G is a, is a holistic approach end-to-end -end, uh, uh, from the access up to the, uh, to the, to the core or even the, the service centers. The idea is that 5G will come in a, in a very, uh, I would say, in an evolutionary way by identifying services, identifying clear market niches. And for that, we can use, I mean, the idea is to use the same kind of providers and the same kind of partnerships we have right now. With the incorporation of new players or, or the change of roles of some of the current players, this is something that would, uh, NFV would help, definitely, because it should be much, well, it should be, it will be much easier to incorporate someone with, that comes with a, some brilliant idea or to adapt to, to any change in the, uh, in the ecosystem. So 5G has three distinct major use cases, one of which is massive IoT, Internet of Things. We're starting to see a lot of IoT deployments at this stage already. So is IoT in some way an enabler for NFV? Oh, yes, I mean, definitely. Um, Again, it's something that uh, with more, most, many of the cases in, 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 in 5G that we are considering are very, very related to very limited latency and very um, stringent requirements on the, on the local loop. And that uh, cannot, cannot be achieved unless you have a very... Uh, the computational pro uh, power is very close to the, uh, to the end systems. And this is, I mean, this is NFV, probably is MEC as well, MAC. But it's the, it's the combination of both what uh, will make this uh, possible. Diego, thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure.